welcome to Hermetic Journeys. Hey, good to see you again. And thanks for watching, as always, from the bottom of my heart. This video is jam-packed full of fun stuff and, and educational, I hope, interesting, certainly, and of course, goofy, because that's what I do. In any case, I want to tell you about some of the highlights here. Well, first of all, obviously, this emblem, number nine, has to do with trees of some kind. And where better to talk about them than in the forest, right? Under a big, beautiful tree. There we go. Okay, that's number one. Number two, speaking of trees, uh, my friend Steve Kalick, the alchemist from Canada, is uh, allowing me to use one of his videos where he demonstrates an alchemical process, and I've edited it, so you'll see the process to create an alchemical tree or philosophical tree in within his retort through a distillation of antimony. <laughs> really, really cool. That's going to be really, really cool. I know you're going to enjoy that. Additionally, we finally have resolved the riddle as to who the guy in Roman garb is. He's pictured throughout Adelina Fugins and several emblems wearing Roman garb. And a wonderful scholar uh, has revealed that to us. I'm going to introduce you to her. And she's, she and a cadre of scholars from several universities have put together a digital publication dealing with Adelina Fugians, and it is just amazing. So stay tuned for that as well, okay? So we also are going to reveal our mystery guest, okay? Our mystery guest, and, and I will tell you where he's from, what part of the world he's from, and he is from Florence, Italy. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, Florence, on my bucket list without a doubt, okay? And his scholarship literally changed the face of, of European philosophy, certainly Renaissance philosophy. I mean, this is big stuff, and he is an amazing scholar, okay? So, I suppose with all this stuff that's going on, we gotta get moving here. So, let's take a look at the emblem. Okay, in this emblem, emblem number nine, we see a round structure that has glass windows surrounding it, and inside the structure, we see what appears to be an elderly man sitting on a chair, eating the fruit off of a tree which is growing inside the structure. Curious scenario here, isn't it? Of course, the emblem is lovingly colored by Adam McLean of Alchemy website fame. I forgot to mention that. So let's take a look at the motto and see if it sheds some light as to what's going on here. The motto says, lock the tree with the old man in a bedewed house, and by eating of the tree's fruit, the old man becomes young. Hmm, interesting. There's some interesting stuff in the motto alone here. A bedewed house, what does that mean? Well, apparently a house or a structure or perhaps a vessel that has dew in it, okay? Vapors, interestingly enough, okay? And the old man, as he's eating the fruit, he becomes young again. Some sort of fountain of youth or sort of philosopher's stone-ish kind of deal, don't you think? Is that a word? <laughs> I do that all the time. Anyway, so let's see if the epigram sheds further light on this curious scenario. The epigram says, In the garden of wisdom stands a tree which produces gold apples. You should take this tree with our old man, let them be locked up in a glass house, wet with dew, and let them stay there together for many days. Then, oh wonder, he will eat his fill from the tree's fruit, so that he, who is formerly an old man, becomes young again. So we have a couple of interesting clues here that Michael Mayer has given us. One of them uh, is, well, first we're saying it locked him up in a glass house, a man in the tree. Well, obviously the glass house is beginning to sound more and more to me like a retort or a flask, okay? And locking them up for many days, well, that, that seems to me like some kind of gestation period, okay? Also, locking them up, if we're talking about um, a glass vessel in an alchemical lab, I think we're talking about hermetically sealing it, like we looked at in uh, Emblem 8 with the philosophical egg, okay? The hermetically sealing of a vessel so that the vapors don't escape. And it looks like here's what he's driving at as well in Emblem number 9. Pretty cool, huh? So let's, let's take a look at the discourse and see if it sheds any further light on this. The discourse says, whereby the tree restores the old man to youth, for this tree has sweet fruit, ripe and red, which do easily turn into pure blood, being of easy digestion and excellent nutriment, so as to leave nothing superfluous or fecalent in the body. Hmm, 
Now, for some reason, the tree has red ripe fruit. So it went from golden apples to red fruit. I think Michael Myers suggesting some sort of transmutation here, some, call it some sort of transmutation process. We're turning, you know, gold into the Philosopher's Stone, perhaps. It is a red waxy substance. So maybe what's really going on here is that we're talking about a vessel, a flask or a retort, right, that has, is, is gestating the Philosopher's Stone. It's got some golden apples in it, it's got some gold, okay, and we're going to, delve further into this when we look at the tree, which actually is known as the philosophical tree in alchemical texts. And you're going to see why once we start to delve into some of the sources that Michael Meyer ended up using for this particular emblem. There's one more excerpt from the discourse before we look into the sources that I'd like to read to you and see if it further clarifies. This excerpt says, it is added that the old man ought to be shut up with the tree, not in the open air, but in a house, not dry, but moist with dew. Okay, so obviously now, no, it's got to be some sort of flask, right? Or retort, and it's hermetically sealed. The old man must represent something, perhaps sulfur. So we have, you know, the golden apples and we have the sulfur, so we have gold and sulfur. We're locking it, we're hermetically sealing them in a vessel, we're heating it, all right, and then dew is forming, or the vapors from mercury, so mercury is in there too. We're going to find out where that is. Actually, what Michael Myers is referring to is an excerpt, an, an image from another older text, okay, written by a man named Jorgi Agricoles, okay, and, and he lived from 1494 to 1555, so before Michael Myers, so he's obviously referencing this text, and the text is called De Re Metallica, right? And it's an incredible compendium of how metals are excavated, how they're processed, surveyed, really, really fascinating. I read most of the book, it's like 500 pages, but it is so interesting. On page 429, we find something called a distillation room that is used to process mercury ore. Okay, now, as you know, mercury uh, in, in any form is not very good to be around, okay? It's not, <laughs> the vapors can kill you, and you can get sick from handling mercury or, or ingesting it. You don't want to do that. Okay, it's, it's kind of poisonous. So, on page 429, we read, A hollow vaulted chamber, of which the paved floor is made concave towards the center. Inside the thick walls of the chamber are the furnaces. The doors to which the wood is put are in the outer part of the same wall. So we have this round chamber, okay? We have furnaces rimming the inside, and the doors to feed the furnaces are on the outside, because obviously they're processing mercury ore in here, so they, want, they don't want to go inside this thing while the furnaces are going, because they'll be killed, okay? It continues. They place the pots in the furnaces and fill them with crushed ore. Then they cement the pots and the furnaces on all sides with loot, so that none of the vapor may, be, may escape from them. Now, I had to look up loot. I had no idea what it was. Uh, apparently, it's two parts of clay and one part of horse dung and some other stuff. And it creates uh, sort of like silicone does. It creates a sealant. And they used to put this on windows to seal them from uh, the mercury vapors, okay? So you don't want to be in there. Mercury vapors and horse dung. Eesh. Anyway, uh, let's continue here. Between the dome and the paved floor, they arrange green trees. Then they close the door and the little windows and cover them on all sides with moss and loot so that none of the quicksilver, quicksilver, as you know, is a fancy word for mercury, can, is, can exhale from the chamber. Ah, so now there's a tree inside this chamber. Hmm, sound familiar? Okay, and you can see from this image, and I've highlighted the uh, chamber for you. And at the end here, this is the last part, the ore is heated and exudes the quicksilver, of course, the mercury, whereupon, impatient with the heat and liking the cold, it, Quicksilver, escapes to the leaves of the trees, which have a cooling power. When the operation is completed, the smelter extinguishes the fire and opens the doors and the windows and collects the quicksilver, most of which, being heavy, falls of its own accord from the trees and flows into the concave part of the floor. If all should not have fallen from the trees, they are shaken to make it fall. Wow. Okay, so the tree, the tree is used to collect the mercury vapors. Okay, and then some poor soul goes in there and shakes the tree. I don't think Peter Gable's going to be shaking this tree. If you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, I mean, just think about it. Some poor soul has to go in and shake the trees in the mercury tree. Some poor soul. Some poor soul. 
Brother Kenneth, wouldst thou goest and shaketh the trees in the quicksilver melting chamber? Surely you jest. Oh, I do. <laughs> For the queen, in the morrow. How come I'm always tasked with these spook details? Graves, bodies, monsters. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kenny. Uh, it's my brother there who, uh, who did a cameo appearance. <laughs> in any case, <laughs> in any case, uh, so now we have, as you can see, this really, really clarifies the emblem. And I'm going to look at it from the, from the multiple levels. So in my opinion, this emblem has a triple meaning. There are three parts to it. Remember I was talking about Michael Myers' onion, right? The layers to the onion. And, and well, this is a really, really profound one here, okay? So I'm going to list them for you so we can finalize this and move on to the next section. Okay? Number one. On the surface, an old man eating the red fruit from the philosophical tree and becoming young again represents the healing powers of the Philosopher's Stone. It even has the capabilities to prolong life. Number two. On the historical level, the emblem represents the chambers used to process mercury ore, where the mercury is sublimated or collected on trees, hence the tree in the emblem. Number three, on the alchemical level, the glass house represents the retort or flask in the alchemical laboratory, the tree represents mercury, the old man represents sulfur, and the golden apples represent, you guessed it, gold. The golden apples becoming the red fruit demonstrates the transmutation properties of the stone, while simultaneously, these three substances are the main ingredients used by alchemists in its creation. Okay, so those are my three theories concerning the true meaning to this emblem. Now, of course, I could be wrong, and if you think I am, or if you think I've missed something, or you want to add something to it, please leave a comment in the comment section, because you know what? I've learned more from being wrong than I have from being right, and, uh, I'd like to continue my life that way because basically my, my life is riddled with mistakes <laughs> and being wrong. So I have no problem with that. So please, you know, leave me some comments if you're interested or if, you, if you're really inspired to do so, do so because I love getting them. Okay? Now, what I want to show you next is really, really cool. I've got a couple of videos uh, here from a few uh, alchemists. Uh, one of them, of course, is from our good friend, Steve Kalick, uh, the alchemist from Canada. And um, he, he is so gracious in that he has uh, allowed me to use one of his videos that he has created the philosophical tree in a flask, okay? It's actually, actually in a retort because he does it through distillation. And he uses antimony for this particular philosophical tree. And it is so cool. That's one of them. Uh, another one is from uh, an alchemist that I found on the web, uh, L-W-O-W-L. That's, that's what he calls himself. That's his channel. And it's really cool. And that's the first one you'll see. And then there's one by uh, Lawrence Principe. And it's something that I put together. Uh, he, uh, he's written a book, actually, several stuff, but Alchemy Tried in the Fire with William R. Newman. And we've, we've actually talked about Newman uh, in a previous video uh, because he, uh, Lawrence Principe and Newman take uh, these alchemical experiments from George Starkey, a.k.a. Irenaeus Philolathes. Remember him? Okay and they reproduce them in a modern laboratory. And this is so cool. And what Lawrence Principe has come up with is a philosophical tree made from mercury in a flask. Another really cool thing. So we got a couple of really cool videos I wanna show you now. And I think you're really gonna enjoy them. And I think they're just absolutely fascinating. And they're so beautiful. Check it out. So let's, let's watch the videos and I'll stop talking. Here we go.
Wasn't that incredible? <laughs> I mean, a tree inside a flask. How beautiful is that? I know it's just a chemical process, but it's beautiful. Alchemists create such beauty within their flasks, right? They're working with these, some, and sometimes, hazardous chemicals and, and, and substances like mercury and antimony and acids and things like that, and they create such beauty. But that's what this is about, right? It's the, the beauty of this. It's this deep, profound beauty and mystery to these experiments. And early alchemists didn't really understand a lot of what was going on like we do today, but they saw the beauty in it. They saw the creative process taking place. Like helping, assisting in the natural processes of this planet, of God's work, of God's beautiful planet, okay? Sorry for waxing philosophical on you there, but so to conclude, I mean, what a, an incredible emblem this is, right? How layered and complex, but that's what makes it so interesting, right? That's what I love about it. So I'll stop yakking and let's take a look uh, and introduce our mystery guest in part two of this video, right? So stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, this is part two. We're going to introduce our mystery guest today, really amazing scholar. And I'm giving you a clue as to where he came from. That is Florence, Italy. Okay, uh, he studied optics, uh, philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, astrology. He was a physician who assisted people who were sick during the Black Plague, so a very devoted and dedicated physician. Uh, additionally, he was a great musician, really, really cool guy, right? And a Catholic priest. Whoa! So, who is this guy, this enigma, right? His name is Marsilio Ficino. Hey, Marsilio Ficino! What's the big deal with Marsilio Ficino? Why am I talking about him? Okay, well, first of all, uh, back then, uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire was invading parts of Europe, specifically Spain, and uh, a lot of the people there who wanted to maintain their identity and their religion and their culture left and went to Italy, okay? Uh, there was a huge diaspora of uh, folks uh, during that period, and a lot of these texts that were long forgotten or missing, just plain missing, showed up through this diaspora. Okay, it's kind of cool actually. It worked out really uh, for our benefit. So um, there's a, there was a very powerful family back then uh, called the Medici family um, who used their influence to uh, bring to light a lot of these lost texts. Uh, they were sort of the Rockefellers of today, if you will, uh, or of yesterday actually. <laughs> but anyway, uh, really interesting. So the Medici family hired Marsilio Ficino, who was a brilliant scholar and prodigy, to translate these texts from Greek into Latin. Now once the texts were translated into Latin, those who could read had access to this material, right? So one of the more important things that Ficino translated was the complete Platonic corpus, all of Plato's works. Now. Plato was known in Europe at the time. However, the, there were fragments of his work, not the entire thing. So, so Medici felt it important that Ficino translate these works into Latin so people could take advantage of them and, 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 uh, and love them like they are today, okay? Interestingly, midway through Ficino's translation of the Platonic Corpus, all right, Cosimo Medici came to him and said, Look, I need you to translate these texts, this particular text. It's even more important than Plato's text. Wow. What could be more important than the works of Plato, one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived, okay? Well, it was the Corpus Hermeticum, or the Hermetic Corpus, okay? Now, the Hermetic Corpus uh, was written by Hermes Trismegistus, okay? Now, remember, we talked about him in the very first video, way back, video number one. And he was the author of the Emerald Tablet that Isaac Newton translated, okay? So he also, he wrote a lot of other stuff, okay? And, and this 
the, the Hermetic Corpus was a big part of what he did. Now, I happen to have this book on the Hermetic Corpus, highly recommended. It. It's a neat little book, really thin, um, and there's a lot of really wonderful philosophy in here, written by Hermes Trismegistus. Now, so why was that important? Why was that more important than Plato's work? I mean, it's just another book on philosophy, right? Well, it was believed back then that Hermes Trismegistus was a contemporary, was contemporaneous with Moses. In other words, they lived at the same time, all right? And Moses was an Egyptian too, which kind of made a little sense there. So interestingly, um, they believed that the Hermetic Corpus may have influenced Moses and Greek philosophy as well, right? Very interesting. So now the church fathers had a little problem with that, but they did love the Platonic Corpus because Plato talked about the eternal nature of the soul. The other thing that, uh, that Ficino did, uh, and here's a wonderful book on him, by the way, uh, that I, I, I love. Of course, of course, I love all my books, right? I always say that. Uh, and it's edited and introduced by Angela Voss, and it's a really excellent work um, on, on uh, not Marsilio Ficino. I'm not getting kickbacks on this book either. So certainly recommend it if you're interested in Marsilio. He's a really fascinating character. Well, in any case, um, he created something called the Florentine Academy. And that was modeled after Plato's Academy. So Ficino was very influenced by Plato and of course by the Corpus Medicum. And through that academy, uh, a lot of uh, amazing Italian scholars came out of it. One of them was another one of my favorite scholars, Giovanni Pico della Marandola. Oh, why does that roll off my tongue? Because I read this book. <laughs> I read, this is the 900 Theses of Giovanni Pico della Marandola. Okay, um, they were essentially um, a conversation he wanted to have with the Pope at the time. It was Pope uh, Innocent VIII. And interestingly enough, um, Pico had this kind of universal sense in other words, he wanted to unite all religions, okay? And it's a beautiful thought, and, and it's actually some of the most beautiful philosophy has come out of his 900 Theses. Uh, and so, unfortunately, Pope Innocent VIII didn't think very highly of that. Um, in fact, he, he, he condemned the text as being largely heretical. And so it was burned, you couldn't talk about it, you, you were caught talking about it and reading it, you were excommunicated from the church. Didn't go well for Pico, unfortunately, but he is a tre another tremendous scholar from the Italian Renaissance, along with Marsilio Ficino. Um, just wonderful work, and check out this stuff when you have a chance. So in, in any case, uh, that was what happened, and so he created this uh, Florentine Academy and literally changed the face of European philosophy. I really, truly believe I can say that. Through the introduction of Plato's works, and the Corpus Hermeticum and his commentaries on these works were very impactful to people back then. In fact, he influenced people, some very important people from that time. And let me read you a little excerpt from this particular book on Ficino that tells you how important his work was. Such geniuses as Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, John Dowland, and Claudio Monteverdi all swam in the tide of spiritual renewal instigated by Ficino. Isn't that incredible? So he influenced the philosophy of Europe. Just amazing. Okay, I'll start. I'll stop that. Now, why am I bringing Ficino up? Well, because Michael Meyer mentions him in, in this particular work, okay? In fact, uh, in the discourse he says, Marsilio Ficinus, in his book of Preserving the Life of Students, writes that in order to attain long life, it is commodious or advantageous for a man to daily suck the milk of some certain beautiful and young woman. I don't know what to say. But in any case, uh, you know, people back then were looking for a fountain of youth kind of a thing, right? They wanted to, because people didn't live long back then, right? If you were in your 60s, you were a really old man. Okay, so that would make me ancient, right? So, so that's what's interesting. So they, a lot of people had different ideas as to how to do things. And we've seen some of these things, some of these remedies in Atlanta Fugians, right? We've seen them uh, pop up here and there. And there. Some of them were a little odd. Interestingly, that very same Pope, Innocent VIII, who condemned uh, Pico della Marandola's uh, 900 Theses, spent the last days of his life being breastfed on his deathbed.
We interrupt this ridiculous program to bring you a special news bulletin. Intrepid Scholar uncovers the identity of Mystery Man. Who is that mystery man that haunts the pages of the arcane 17th century emblem book, Atalanta Fugians? Thanks to the industrious scholarship of Donna Bilek, a tireless PhD from the Bard Graduate Center, we now have the answer to that burning question. It is none other than Count Michael Meyer himself. The answer was hidden in plain sight, but not from the keen eye of Donna Bilek. Thank you, Donna, for unraveling this enigma and solving the riddle of the mystery man. Wow. So it's been Michael Meyer all along. <sighs> Hidden in plain sight, man. Who would have known, right? I guess people who know what they're doing. <laughs> in any case, uh, there's one other thing I'd like to show you guys before we sign off today. And that is a, uh, a publication, a digital publication that uh, Donna and a cadre of scholars have put together. And it is just amazing. It's called Furnace and Fugue. So let's take a look at it. So here we are at the main page of Furnace and Fugue. Now, although it has a web address and domain, it is a digital publication. It is a book. Now, what I think Donna and the cadre of scholars and musicians and mathematicians and writers have done is to create a, a version of Adelina Fugians in the way that Michael Meyer would have originally wanted it presented. And I think I can say that safely because of the nature of what they've done here. It's, first of all, it's done with heart and soul. Um, and it's, it's beautifully organized. And where do you see this thing? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little background before we delve into this, okay? Now, Donna initially began this project during her 2013 fellowship at the Science History Institute. And if that sounds familiar to some of you, that's the place in Philadelphia that I got to spend some quality time with a 400-year-old copy of Atalanta Fugians, gingerly turning the pages with my greasy fingers. So in any case, I really, uh, it was a cathartic experience, as you might imagine. Really, really special. So this project was produced at the Brown University Library and received support from the library's digital publications initiative. Now, Donna wasn't the only person, obviously, who worked on this, okay? It's a tremendous effort. Um, so her co-editor was a, another wonderful scholar, uh, Tara Numadal. And uh, Tara and Donna have done a spectacular job in putting this thing together, okay? So let's delve into it, and I'll stop yakking. Over here on the left, we have contents, the table of contents. Over here, we have scholarly essays. And I highly recommend these essays, as they were written from scholar, by scholars from around the world who have been studying Adelina Fugians for years and years and years. And it's really, really interesting. You should definitely check these out. But let's take a look at the digital edition of Adelina Fugians. I'm going to click on digital edition up here. And as you can see, wow, here are all 50 emblems right here laid out in front of us. All right. Let's take a look at one we're familiar with because of today's video. All right. Now, this is really, really amazing. On the left hand side here, we see a pristine digital scan of the original book. All right. On the right, we have the English translation. So let's scroll down a little bit. And as I scroll, you'll notice on the left hand side, it will synchronize. All right with the music here, with the sheet music. This is the original fugue from the book, of course. And here is a modern uh, version of a modern notation of the original fugue. Now, this was put together by a scholar named Lauren Ludwig, and he's the music director. And Lauren Ludwig uh, is a guy who determined that Michael Meyer only wrote 10 of these fugues. The other 40 were written by a man named John Farmer. And we spoke about him in a previous video as well. So Michael Meyer adopted John Farmer's fugues and brought them into Adelina Fugians. Now, here's the really, well, it's all cool, but here's the really cool part. This is performed by a solo voice ensemble called Les Canards Chantants. Sorry for my lousy French, but that's, that's, what they're, that's what they're called. And they are absolutely spectacular. Coming from a musician and a, well, a singer of some sort, um, I... Well, I'm just going to play this for you. And as I play this, you'll notice that the notes light up to correspond with the voices. So you can see what's going on in the notation as the voices correspond. So I'm going to play this for you right now. This is the Fugue from Emblem 9, performed by Les Canards Chantants. Hold on. Here we go.
I mean, that is just absolutely lovely. Um, I hope you enjoyed that wonderful, wonderful performance by Les Connards Chantant. Now, um, of course, on the left-hand side now, we're presented with the epigram once again. Now, interestingly here, the epigram is in poetic verse, which is, I believe, the way it was originally intended. So, again, beautifully done. Oh, and one other thing. You can also view the music as in piano roll format, okay, if you decided to want to do that. It's kind of cool as well. Now, we continue to scroll down here, and, of course, we have the discourse, and it's a wonderful translation. Um, I will be using this uh, for my research as well. So now I have an, another tool uh, to try to understand, make sense of this complex but enigmatic book. Okay? Now, if I click on contents, this is really cool here. Um, if you look at early modern, this, there's some wonderful articles here on early modern alchemy. If I click on that, it gives you a, a wonderful background on the beginnings of alchemy and how it came about. And then, of course, uh, there's a biography of Michael Meyer and the making of Adelina Fugians. These are all really, really interesting things to read, uh, certainly um, to give you really solid background on this material, which is so complex and so deep. And, of course, again, there are the images. I just have to, re I just have to restate here that every emblem is in that format. So they've, they've done this to every emblem. OK, um, the amount of work that has gone into this is just nothing short of astonishing. So I encourage you to explore this wonderful, wonderful gift that Donna Bilek and these incredible scholars have put together for us to enjoy. And it's all free. Oh, my goodness, it's free. So you can just just look at this and, and explore it again. The address is Furnace and Fugue. Dot org. Please enjoy. Okay, so thank you so much for watching. As always, thank you to all of you who have been watching for so long. And thank you to new subscribers. Love you guys. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Uh, you know, I do these once a month usually or so. And uh, we have a lot of fun. Uh, it, and we, I try to inject some uh, ridiculous humor into uh, some pretty heavy-duty philosophical stuff. So, um, because that's how I am. I'm just a goofball. But anyway, thank you for watching, and I will see you uh, next time, and it will be Emblem 10. Oh, my goodness. Wow, we're really getting there. Only 41 more to go. <laughs> In any case, have a great day. Be well and stay safe. And thanks again.